Be sure to subscribe, follow, like, and leave a comment if you enjoyed the show. And as always, thanks for listening. Welcome to Bigfoot Crossroads, Evans and Jim, a couple of Thank you. fellow Bigfooters from the fine state of Oklahoma. Uh, you guys reside around the Oklahoma City area, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, sir. Uh, right. Great. Evans, I've known you for a while. I've talked to you on past shows that I've done. And uh, Jim, this is the first time we've spoken. Certainly. Uh, Evans had nothing but good things to say about you. Um, I don't know how well he knows you, but, uh, <laughs> <laughs> sounds like, okay. <laughs> I trust his judgment. Uh, but, but no, the, the whole thing, uh, it always interests me, especially coming from this state. When you hear stories about Bigfoot in the Pacific Northwest, uh, you know, the, the homeland of the Sasquatch. Uh, the experts for a long time, you know, are talking about you got to go out into the mountains. You got to go to all these remote places where nobody is. And that's where you find Bigfoot. You know, they don't come around people. And then you start hearing stories in Oklahoma, especially uh, of Bigfoot being right around town. And uh, in some small towns, even coming into the town itself and raiding trash cans and stuff. And it all seems rather mind blowing. Uh but then whenever you start meeting some of these people and hearing their stories, you realize, you know, well, maybe it's not so far fetched. I mean, these little small puddle towns, as I call them, but there's a place in Oklahoma, uh, on the outskirts of Oklahoma city, the biggest city that Oklahoma has to offer. There's over a million people there. And just on the outside of town there, there is a, uh, wildlife refuge called Stinchcomb. Now, this area, over the years, I've heard people mention it. And I've looked at the location. And it's one of those things that kind of makes you scratch your head a little bit because, man, there's just, I mean, it butts up to major highways. There's neighborhoods that are just sitting right next to it. I'm sure at some point you can see downtown oklahoma city from the place but evans Mm -hmm. uh you went and you've researched there a lot but you just recently uh went there and we got to talking and i thought it would be an interesting episode to talk about stenchcomb and i had asked you if uh you knew anybody or knew any stories of sightings around the area And that's when you mentioned Jim. Right. Uh, Why don't you tell the listeners uh, how you met Jim, how you became aware of Jim and all that. And then, Jim, we can get into your story. Okay. Yeah. In 2013, 2014, when I was really getting back into uh, uh, the subject of Bigfoot, uh, I was living over uh, in Canadian County, west of Oklahoma City, in a town called Yukon. And uh, one evening, uh, saw a notice that the TV show Finding Bigfoot was going to be holding a town hall meeting. They were filming a Central Oklahoma episode, and um, they were going to hold it at uh, the Express Ranch's barn out on the north side of Yukon, right on the river. Uh, it's a huge place, huge ranch. Um, and, uh, right. And so, uh, my daughter, my oldest daughter is very interested in Bigfoot also. So, you know, we, uh, uh um, you know, went out there that evening, tried to get there early, got in line, uh, and they were holding the uh, town hall meeting upstairs in the loft of the barn. Um, and, uh, 
were lucky enough to be able to get seats in the town hall meeting and the place was packed. They were turning people away. Uh, I don't know how many people were there. I think there was 200 in the town hall meeting. Um, but, uh, that's where, uh, you know, of course, uh, the, the finding Bigfoot crew comes out and they do the introductions and they say, you know, uh, if you've had, if you believe you've had an experience or an encounter, uh, raise your hand and, you know, hands went up everywhere all across there. And, uh, then they started, uh, letting people tell about their encounters. And that's where I first heard Jim tell about his encounter that he and his wife had. I believe that was in about, uh, 2007, Jim, something like that. Let me think. Uh, it was about, uh, 13 years ago or so. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So, so maybe, yeah. So maybe I, right then, maybe just a year later, right in okay. there. But uh, heard Jim tell about his encounter and several other people in the room, and uh, so that's when I first became aware of of what he and his wife had experienced. And uh, so then, you know, we've uh, Jim is uh, part of our uh, North Canadian R- River Project, our our group our local group uh, on our team there. And uh, he has lots of experience uh, since then in the, in the Stinchcombe area, going up and down the river, not just in Stinchcombe, but the North Canadian river. Uh, and uh, so. Cal- you, Cal- you meant to Lake you fallen. Right. But uh, that's kind of how we got to know each other. And so uh, I'll just turn it over to Jim and, uh, Matt, if you have some questions about his encounter, he can. Yeah, he can uh, tell his. Absolutely. Uh, so you, Jim, you started out as a witness. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I was. I was what I call a ten percenter because I'm a guy and I don't want to be wrong. And if they drug a bigfoot in or found one or something like that, I can say, "Well, I gave it a chance." Mm-hmm. Now I'm a hundred percent, and that's all from the stench. Code. I floated the North Canadian River from Calumet to Lake Eufaula in different stretches, mainly the Stinchcomb, but all of it from Calumet. I don't know if that's 200 miles of river or what it is, but I've experienced zero that I can't explain or blew me away or anything like that anywhere else but uh, about a mile and a half stretch maybe in the Stinchcomb. What was your experience? Well, uh, I floated at the time I floated for over 20 years. I probably floated about 30 years now. I don't float as often as I used to, but I would float from anywhere from two to five nights a week uh, with my business partner and best friend back then. Um, Then I got married. uh, My wife's since passed, but she loved floating it just as much as I did. And one night, uh, so what I'm saying is me not being a big footer back then, and it's like I said to Evans earlier, how many things did I miss that happened and I just wasn't aware of? Well, when it smacked me straight in my face, the, believe me, my radar is always up now. But uh, the, the first night was... Uh, My wife, Julie, and I was floating with two friends. It was probably about 1130 at night, and they were lagging behind us. We couldn't hear them. Uh, We didn't know how far behind they were, and we really didn't care. We was on the river. I mean, the worst day being on the river is the best day ever. So um, we was doing nothing. We wasn't paddling. We was just drifting with a really slow current. And at night, I call it in stereo. We listening to uh, to owls, uh, watching a random uh, bat fly down, swoop down, something like that. And I was about twelve to fourteen foot from the bank. I was towards the middle of the river. She was skirting the river's edge. She was about three foot, maybe, off of the river, uh, river's bank, and. Uh, I'm looking to my left. She's to my right. I hear a loud gasp and jerk my head over to look at her. And she jerked her head to look at me. She had been looking quite 
I'd been looking left, so we both came to the middle, looked, staring at each other, and I was hollering, what? What? And her eyes was about to bug out of her head. Behind her, and I tell everybody this because I don't try to convince anybody what I saw. I know what I saw. It was a big foot or it was a man in a monkey suit. And trust me, if it was a man in a monkey suit, what was the joke? Because this giant thing that's six six and hairy and probably every bit of 400 pounds if not more slowly stood took a half turn and two steps and disappeared now what i saw was more silhouette than anything but my wife was eye to eye with it within three foot of it they could have and i got you know her to talk about it because she went into a straight panic i mean like a shock and um, it was probably 10 minutes but it seemed like an hour until i could get her to talk and i was like listen woman you have got to please share with me what did you see? What in the world was that? And, uh, you know, she finally, you know, just told me that she, our paddles was right in front of us. So, you know, we've got an oar hanging off each side. And we wasn't talking and we wasn't paddling. So we was completely stepped. But when she was going down that bank's edge, what she saw was she thought there was a big bush on the edge of the bank. So approaching it, she she moved her paddle as not to connect with this bush. Well, when it scraped across the top of her kayak, it jerked its head and looked straight at her from a squatted position. And she said it was drinking from the river. Wow. So when it jerked its head and their eyes connected, that's when she gasped and turned to me. And that's when I turned to her. She never saw it stand and turn. She was completely, just completely terrified out of her mind and uh, couldn't look back behind her. She just stared at me blankly and that's all she could do. And for years after that, she always called it Littlefoot. Because she never saw it stand in its its size, mm. uh, she just saw it in a squatted position. Orange coppery eyes, uh, not not something that I saw or could tell that detail. But uh, she was like, it looked like it had like a orangutan eyes or something like that, like an orangey, coppery type eyes. And uh, that was my first. And only eye sighting in 30 plus years of floating. Did you guys have any sort of light source other than just natural? No, no. And you're no. Uh, floating a river <laughs> through the middle <laughs> listen, of nowhere well, in the middle of the listen, night. <laughs> well, you've got, you've got Yukon now, uh, uh, Evans will know about where this is. We get in at Yukon, north of uh, the Brahms there, actually at Bob Fox Place. And that's where we start to float down. You're in the middle between Yukon and Oklahoma City. And you get a light glow off of both of those places. And to be honest with you, unless I'm tying a knot or something like that, I loathe lights at night. I, I don't want them. To, don't want anybody else to turn them on around me. I don't like them. I, I, so, right, it blows your night vision, and yeah. and if there's if there's any kind of moon at all, uh, it's really bright on the river. I mean, you can definitely yeah. e easily see your way down the river. Easily, uh, e at, e at you, night can see, there. you can also when the when the water's low. If you don't have any lights on, by looking at the water ahead of you, you can tell what water is deep and what water is shallow mm -hmm. and go that way so you don't, you know, stick yourself in and have to get out and drag it and stuff like that. I just don't like uh, lights, never have, never, never, never really use them.
And the light yeah, off of, the light off of Yukon and the light off of Oklahoma City is plenty. Yeah. Right. I, if we, I'm, I'm just thinking I mean you've had you said about thirteen years to process this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I know there's people listening and the first place everybody's mind goes is oh it was a person and i'm just trying to uh point Big out six foot yeah like there's a giant you know uh, not six, giant six, but above six, normal hairy. person right oh, and, and, and evans will attest to this the side of the river that this is on there's very few trails very few anything and it's muddy swampy and very thick and very remote where where we saw this if it was back then so let's say it was 13 years ago 13 years ago i don't care what anybody tells evans or you no one was floating that river Mm -hmm. because i was there i would have seen them zero people was floating that river if it was a man in the monkey suit what was the joke he stood silently, turned, and took two steps and disappeared. He was shooting long odds in a gunny suit or whatever they call it that someone was going to float by there. Why didn't he yell? I had to crap my pants and fell in the river. You know, I, what was what was the joke if it was a person? To be honest with you, I'm a tile man, and I do measurements, thousands of them a day. I know what something is by looking at it. What I saw was six, 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 seven, and four hundred plus pounds. And like I said before, I'm not trying to convince anybody this is what I saw. Right. Yeah, if it and if it's during the warm season out there, that place is so thick, it's like a jungle. Poison ivy, briars, ticks are terrible, snakes. Insane. Yeah. Yeah, it's a sauna, and there's mosquitoes are horrible. So you know, if you're wandering around out there in those woods at night, uh, that's that's just crazy. Yeah, yeah. He, here's the the thing about Stinchcomb is you know I talked about it being in close proximity to Oklahoma City, and then you're you've mentioned Yukon. The these little towns are just suburbs of Oklahoma City, basically. However, this area is freaking remote i yes. mean evans you just recently sent me like aerial photos of the place like i you know i've looked at it on satellite imagery hundreds of times there's there's nobody walking into this place at night <laughs> like that's not gonna no, happen we're, right. we're talking we're talking swamps bogs cattails ponds thick woods you know i was a 10 percenter until I saw this and it was a, a whole shift in everything of the way I think from that moment on uh, concerning the topic. Right. And the finding Bigfoot people, they came here because I called them, not because I'm passionate about Bigfoot, but because I was watching their show and I was like, these people are passionate about this. I cook food in late time. You know, this is out of my wheelhouse. I said, I'm going to call. Them. And I did. And it wasn't uh, maybe the next day. Moneymaker called me on the phone and said, we're coming to Oklahoma. And I was like, you got to get the hell out <laughs> Get the hell out of here, you know. And he was like, no, we're coming. I'm going to send out a producer or whatever. About a week ahead, we'll be back with you to tell you when we're coming. Well, I was going to ask you how that aspect of everything kind of came to be. You just yeah, that's how they got here. You bet. Now, I called them, you know, this was after the the fact and on down the road a little bit, but uh, a few years after it happened when the show came on and it had been a couple, three years, but uh, uh, my wife had passed by the time I had called them. But uh, at any rate, uh, yeah, that's how it came to be. Now, had you, after that sighting, had you started investigating things on your own had you heard of any more sightings i'm going to tell you that yeah i I have heard of another uh, sighting there and i'll tell you about it but quickly on as far as i go i I was wanting to go with evans in the group uh this past weekend and and uh things kept me from doing that but but uh 
and I don't want to offend anybody or anything like that. I've never left the house in search of Bigfoot ever. Mm -hmm. Now, since that night, do I look when I go? Am I, am I conscious and, and trying to go like, what was that? What made that noise? Yes. Very, very much so. Now, before that night, I, I don't know if you know this part of this, but over a, let's say a 20 year period, I saw eight dead deer on the bank. And I'm talking about right on the bank. And I mean, right in the exact same spot. Now I have floated cumulative over 10,000 North Canadian river miles. Easy, easy. And I have not seen one dead deer anywhere other than this spot. And there's been eight. Now, probably three of them was mutilated. The other five was just broken. And I mean, every single bone in their body broken. Now, when I brought this up to Bobo from the show, he said he's had people relay messages to him or tell him stories that Bigfoot ambushes them, which I am a big believer in, like the hides behind a tree. And that's why they always have a rock to throw. It's because they love ambushing white-tailed deer. But he said that he had heard uh, stories of them snatching them up and grabbing them by the back legs and swinging them like a baseball bat against a tree. This is what I saw on the Stinchcomb Bank in this one spot. I'm telling you, every rib was broke. Every leg had multiple breaks, the neck, the back, everything. But when I saw these before I ever saw Bigfoot, I never even, Bigfoot never even came into my deal. I was just like, how weird is this? How wild is that? Bigfoot didn't even come. I thought dead deer poacher mm -hmm. until I started looking at them. I've killed a hundred you know, deer myself until I started looking for a bullet hole or an arrow hole and then finding that these things are completely broken. I mean, multiple breaks, crazy amount of breaks. So that happened there. Then I had two rock throws there that after after I my encounter uh, one of them was a girlfriend at the time wanted to go on a night float so I took her a uh, on the way back we went from what I call point A to point A from the iron bridge up and then turned around was coming back when a rock uh, came out of the woods I'm going to say 40-50 pounds no man on the planet could have thrown this rock as far as it went. No man on this planet could have thrown it a quarter of the distance it went. It came from inside the woods and it caught our attention because we heard it click, 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 click. And it was the rock clipping limbs as it was flying towards us. Comes out and just lands uh, probably a couple, three feet from my girlfriend, splashes her, gets her all wet. She was a little cra crazy of a person. <laughs> she banks and runs into the woods. Now, this is at dusk. So I'm like, oh, my God. <clears throat> so I bank and run in the woods after. We look around. Now, she, had no, she was aware of my stories. And she was like, I want to see a Bigfoot. That's why she did what she did, and, and that because she was fearless. But uh, uh, we looked around. There was no tracks. There was no anything for us to see. Uh, and I looked around and I was like, you know something? There's not a rock anywhere around here. There's not a baseball sized rock. There's not a big rock. There's no rocks. I just took note of that. So we get in our kayaks and it's starting to get dark now. And we, as soon as we start floating, something's beside us. And she's like, do you hear that? And I'm like, God, I hear that. I hear it. You know? She's like, you know, that's two-legged. I've owned a horse all my life. That's not four-legged. That's two-legged. I was like, man, you don't have to convince me. I know exactly what this is. And I'm going to say it followed us about a quarter of a mile until it started veering off into the woods. 
So we bank at one of the really nice beaches they got out there. We bank at the beach on the opposite side of the river. And uh, we we're just sitting there. It was like, oh, my God, that was so wild, you know, and talking about the rock throw and all of that. When out, you know, in the darkness, a deer, a doe, and I know the difference, uh, starts screaming. I mean, screaming like high pitched. And it was like, <laughs> but during it, there was a, <clears throat> there was a, a grunting noise and there was a noise sounding like a fist hitting a pillow, like a pop, pop, pop. and uh, the deer went down to uh, uh, and just abruptly stopped. And I looked at her, and I mean, with a I've got goosebumps just retelling this part of it. And I looked at her and I, I said, I know you say you were, because she was always saying, well, I'm like, you know, I used to be, a, I'm the 10 percenter or, you know, what you used to be. And I said, where are you at now? And she said, I'm about 65 <laughs> percent, but I'm 100 percent that I'll never run into the woods again. And uh, so that happened. And then my present girlfriend, she wanted to go at night. And uh, I took her, this was only, uh, this was less than a year ago, anyway, and uh, we got up uh, the river a little ways, and we had passed a beaver or two. We passed a snake coming across in front of us, and she's a little, she's not, she's a little bit of a city girl. I, I thought that was going to be a turnaround deal, and she didn't. We saw a snake drop out of a tree, didn't affect her. Then this rock came, and we, you know, heard something we both can't really identify what we heard to make us both go what and look in that direction but we saw a rock probably about the same size about a 40 50 pound rock and it was probably when i saw it it was probably about three foot off the water and then we saw it go into the water and splash real big and uh we just both <laughs> froze and listened and i mean there was not a sound there was not anything and uh, I just thought I wasn't going to say anything <laughs> to her, but I just screamed a loud, deep, <gasps> just as loud as I could out there. And there was like nothing. And she was like, when this is over with, I'm going to kill you. <laughs> but nothing, you know, because it was right, real silent right after I screamed, too. And I thought I might hear, hear movement or, or something like that, but, but nothing. Now, other than that, the only thing I can tell you about out there is uh, north of the Turnpike, um, or west of the Turnpike, I guess it would be, there's a property owner adjacent to the Turnpike that has made a rude cutout, and it's been out there for 20 years in in uh, probably 150, 200-pound piece of metal uh, of a Bigfoot. And he shot it like 200 times. <laughs> no one's ever interviewed this guy. No one's ever talked to this guy and said, hey, why did you make a Bigfoot and shoot it all these times? Did it scare your old lady? Did it kick your dog or what? But it's out there. So those are my experiences. Uh, I've got a story uh, that was shared with me that uh, this guy was unsolicited. This guy knew nothing of my experiences and says a Bigfoot or more than one Bigfoot basically attacked his friends there and threw rocks at them, threw sticks at them, backed three men out into the river up to their chest. And the story is bawling and crying until uh, these Bigfoot quit erupting in the in the trees above them and uh evans this is where the trail is where you go on the east side of the river and there's a mm -hmm. little drop down and there's a bank a real narrow bank that people hang out on there that bank used to be a lot bigger and there used to be a rope swing on a on a right uh, cotton, yeah on a cottonwood tree i know so, i know where you're talking about that's where this happened. Wow. A rope swing but, on a tree, that sounds like a swimming hole. 
Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right. You can swing clear out in the middle of the river from this. But anyway, yeah, that, and, that, and that's my experiences. Yeah, and that's the thing. Uh, uh, it's so close to an urban area that, yeah, you do have the kids that go out there and party. There's some there's some trails along the east side, and there's a public parking lot. Uh, and you and at times, you know, you'll run into homeless people camping out there. Mm-hmm. Um, Oklahoma City Police Department kind of tries to keep that area cleaned out, but yeah, there's some party spots, and uh, there's some uh, you know. Uh, uh, vagrants that you'll find out there once in a while, but it's pretty much limited to a fairly small area there uh, along the um, southeast side of the refuge. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That sounds like a, a people watching spot. Oh yeah, you, you I'm know, sure. We hear lots of reports uh, from areas just like that all the time. Uh, mm-hmm. Lovers' lanes, you know, party spots, dead end roads swimming mm-hmm. holes um there is a spot up here in northeastern oklahoma that uh a lot of off-road guys hang out at and uh drive their jeeps over the rocks and stuff and uh there was a report from a woman whose brother was a deputy sheriff i believe if i'm remembering correctly where they had been called out there because Something was standing in the tree line one night, screaming at them and pelting their cars with rocks and tree limbs. Mm-hmm. And they didn't want to say what it was, <laughs> but, but they wanted the sheriffs to come uh, escort them out. Wow. Yeah, no, the city of Oklahoma City uh, does allow some waterfowl hunting out there. and They have a drawing for the duck blinds out there. Uh, for each fall and winter. And uh, a few years ago, I drew out on a blind and uh, went out there early one morning and it was cold uh, and climbed into the blind. And uh, this was before daylight and something a couple of hundred yards behind me screamed. I mean, screamed loud, like an angry scream. Uh, you know, one of those that makes the hair stand up and everything. And uh, One of the guys that was with us said, uh, what was that? And I was thinking to myself, I, I think I know what that is, but you know, I didn't, I didn't mention that in that company, but, uh, uh, yeah, whatever it was, was big. And it was, it was not, ha- it sounded like it was not happy that we were there. Mm-hmm. And that's the thing. The trails don't go that far on the East side because it drops down into, like Jim was saying, it drops down into this real swampy, uh, mucky area. And so the, um, there's just there's just nowhere to have trails, uh, and then it goes right straight to the river. Uh, but the it's middle of the, the refuge, right? <laughs> yeah. So uh, the middle of the the middle of it is kind of a, a swamp, uh, real boggy area, and then the river runs through that. So um, strips just, of strips of land with water on both sides. Yeah. Yeah, um, there's reports of these things being spotted or tracks being found all up and down that river and that river system. And uh, you learn real fast that it seems like these things uh, out in that part of Oklahoma, you'll have, you know, the rivers and the creeks and everything, and then you have basically canyons and that's where you find the trees at and then Mm -hmm. as you get back east uh towards oklahoma city things start growing above ground again but this place has kind of created almost an oasis it would seem for these things out there yeah it does to me and i'm kind of a i I like to say no expert whatsoever but i'm kind of in a uh, uh, the camp that thinks that they maybe migrate a little bit and everything like that. But if they do, if you're going down the North Canadian River and you hit Oklahoma City, that'd be a dead end mm-hmm. to me. Uh, like, mm-hmm. <laughs> I don't know how they would go down the river and get past Oklahoma City to go any further than that. But at any rate, it is a little oasis and it's shock packed full of deer. Uh, right. Yes. What I and my, my understanding is the best 
grow, you know, food for them. And and like I said, these deer that I these eight dead deer that I saw in one spot, they didn't get hit by a car and get there. And mm-hmm. there's no other predator that would have done that to them. I don't care what anybody says about it. I'm a firm believer in a big cat because I've seen them myself. But a big, big cat didn't do this. A big cat didn't break uh, their bones and leave no puncture marks or anything like that. It didn't happen. It wasn't a bear. There was no predator, other predator. There's no, there's no uh, explanation other than Bigfoot, to be honest with you, uh, for the deer and the condition that they were in that i saw yeah i mean that would take something like being hit by a vehicle or uh dropping them out of a helicopter <laughs> yeah <laughs> that's about Which, it. I, I mean i guess technically that's a possibility <laughs> <laughs> we are near an airport there. <laughs> but now well, that's the thing it's um you know when i try to tell talk to people about uh the evidence that we found out there, you know, they look at you and they say, there's no way. It's right here in the middle of the city. Um, you know, there's neighborhoods around it. There's a turnpike. There's a Highway 66. There's, you know, uh, there's just no way. But then when you take people out there and get them immersed in that place, uh, it's like we had some some of our team from northeast Oklahoma came down for the kayak uh, uh, float last weekend. And when we got back in there, they were just amazed. They said they couldn't – they were just so impressed they couldn't believe how thick it was. They said – It's like a jungle. They're, yeah, they're going up through there, and they're saying it could be sitting right there and watching us, and we'd never see it. It's so thick. If you, if you watch Ryan's Squatch Rangers video that he did of that, and we're going up the river there, you know, it's places where the trees are hanging over the river and it's so thick along the bank that something could be sitting there watching you and you'd, you'd never see it. Especially almost impenetrable. In- you can't, you, it's like a wall that you can't see through almost in the, when it's the right time of year. Uh, mm-hmm. But like I said on, on, on my encounter, it stood, took a half turn, took two steps, and disappeared. I don't mean disappeared like hocus pocus. I mean disappeared like the shrubs and the trees was so freaking thick, you could instantly not see it as soon as it stepped in. Those trees on the banks of the river there, it's not like if you got out on the bank of the river and walked into the tree line, you're not going to come out of the tree line in 10 to 15 feet. No, like, right. that's woods right. that surround <laughs> that river. In yes, that area. on both both sides of the river. Yeah. yeah, and there's trees down there that are huge trees, big old bur oaks, cottonwoods the, that are 100, 100, 200 years old. It's it's thick. No, yeah, green briar. Oh yeah, oh yeah. Poison ivy is terrible in there. Uh, it's it's just amazing when you really get somebody down there to look at it. Then they they kind of have to shake their head and say, well, yeah, I mean, anything could be hiding down in here. No, I can't tell you how many people I've taken through uh, in my kayaks that's just got completely hooked by the area and went and bought their own kayaks and then turned they float there and everything. It, it's, I mean, used to back in the day when, when this all occurred, I, I was always scratching my head like, why don't I see more people out here? Why don't I ever see anybody out here? It's crazy, man. This is right here. And you could enjoy it, you know, and the, that was what we were doing. Right. Well, in the last few years, say last last five, six, seven years with the new river sports area, now there's uh, two concessions on Lake Overholster where you can rent kayaks, canoes, and stand up paddle boards, and you can go up yeah. the river. And it's really busy most uh, weekends. You bet but you don't see anybody at night, though. I mean, our group, we left the launch about 7.30 p.m. Uh, by the time we got up there and turned around at dusk, we saw nobody. So at night, there's there's really no not any traffic on the river. And yeah, nighttime is the best time out there. Not, not right. just for Bigfoot, just period in general it's it's the best time to be at well i i'd also think a lot of those uh touristy types that are just going for the little water adventure aren't going to go too far up the river either right mm-hmm. and stenchcomb goes for quite a ways doesn't it a little bit yeah it yeah runs all the way up to the turnpike there on the northwest corner but you can imagine i mean that that makes just for more entertainment and people watching for these creatures uh now that these 
bright colored kayaks and all kinds of people are going up and down that stretch during the day. You uh, talked about the deer being a food source, but Stinchcomb is also known for waterfowl. Do you think these things hunt waterfowl? Oh, yeah. I, the wildlife. Yeah. Go ahead. yeah, wildlife in there is just thick. I'm, uh, not just uh, waterfowl and deer, but uh, all kinds of small mammals. I run into fox, possum, raccoons, skunks, all kinds of wildlife out there. In fact, uh, uh, um, we had a coyote run out of the woods. Uh, just right in the middle of the road there. Uh, one time we were hiking out there. Uh, yeah, he didn't seem to be too concerned about us at all. So, I mean, the, the, the wildlife there is just thick. Mm-hmm. I've so walked, walked on the interior of the woods before and seen duck and goose uh, carcass, feathers everywhere, bones and stuff like that. Doesn't mean Bigfoot killed him, no, but I have seen them on the interior of the woods and in the area of where these deer were killed as well, just not right on top of where they were. What do you guys think about Bigfoot fishing? Complete possibility. Yeah, I mean, I, I, they could uh, they get out there See, and noodle, just like some of these other guys get out there and noodle for catfish. That's fishing. what I'm asking about because uh, I did a show not too long ago with a couple ladies where – one of them, her sighting was she was fishing uh, in on a river bank, and this thing, uh, according to her, came and stood up out of the water, and mm-hmm. wow, scared the crap out of her. <laughs> right, yeah, Not literally, yeah. but maybe it did. But uh, the thing that I found interesting about that particular sighting was the exact spot she was fishing. She said was a real popular spot for local guys to go and noodle. Yeah, And, you know, <laughs> usually with noodling, I don't know how many listeners are aware of this, but they'll put like, you know, an old barrel or tires or something down there to attract the catfish. So they, they know where to go or the place will already have some sort of natural cave or hole or something for the catfish to get down into. Mm-hmm. You also want you want you wonder if they're mim- mimicking uh, behavior that they observe right i mean how long would it take them to figure out watching a guy go and go into the water and pull up a fish right Mm -hmm. so anytime Mm -hmm. i hear about you know bigfoot hanging around a river or a creek or something like that 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 comes to mind um oh definitely yeah i'm sure they take advantage of every food source that's available there and one of the things that i was surprised by at that town hall meeting other people telling their uh, encounters was um, about that time, maybe a few years before that, they had started building some new neighborhoods, uh, housing developments out along near the river uh, between Yukon and El Reno. And there were people there at the town hall meeting talking about these things raiding their trash cans. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, they would hear a bunch of noise and the security lights would come on and they'd run out there and they'd hear something running away and something had been in the trash can and they could tell, well, this wasn't just a raccoon or something like that. It was something large and uh, they'd heard some grunts and things like that. So they felt like these things were coming up there and raiding their, their trash. Yeah, because we're just talking about the stench comb, but I'm a firm believer that they're like I said earlier, that stench comb is almost like a dead end. So they're in the stench comb, but they're also west of the stench comb, up the river. Yeah, because just uh, maybe maybe 15 miles up the river from Yukon is El Reno, the Concho Canton, Casino. Canton. Yeah. Calumet. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it, it runs, that whole river corridor runs all the way up there to the northwest corner of the state at Wood, you know, near Woodward. Boiling Springs State Park is where it starts. Mm. And, um, you know, so they've got they've got a couple of hundred miles there that, you know, they can move up and down the river as they need to. Yeah, so we talk about it, we talk about a relatively small spot, but it's actually a huge spot when you step out of things. Jim, tell me about... Uh your experience with the finding bigfoot show or whatever you're allowed to talk about or i wouldn't uh, do that i'll tell you what, any trouble you get into i'll do my best to get you out of it <laughs> okay deal uh well you know like i said i was the one that called them and and really i just told them my story uh on a recording and then Matt called me back and, and uh, told me they were coming and all that. 
But uh, I hung out with the producer of the show, and we did some traveling around, looking at spots and whatnot, uh, me telling him my story. And um, they ended up coming down, and they rolled with a group. Cast and crew is 20, or it was at that time. And uh, uh, we uh, went out uh, on the river right off the bat, and then we did once again later on in the deal. But we went, I've got four kayaks, and uh, uh, Renee stayed back, and she went to another site, and the guys and I uh, did a float uh, up the river and around the river, and and I pointed out some stuff and everything. you know, um, Renee experienced something in Lindsay that I can't believe that they left out of the show. And uh, the hair samples, which is the short story, uh, Cliff told me face to face that, and we have one of the most, the best hair uh, places in the world, is my understanding. Evans, you'd know a lot better than I would. Are you talking about the the diagnostic labs? Yeah, the hair lab that like you know, the DNA baboon, labs. You take them a baboon hair and you stick them in this machine and it says that's a baboon. You stick a zebra hair and it spits it out. It's a zebra. Well, they went to this place and they had gathered hair samples from three different areas: uh, Stenchcomb, Lindsay, and out by Concho or Lucky Star Casino. And uh, the results, what Cliff said quote to me was um related but unknown species hair samples were all related but unknown species from three different areas and they're i don't know Lindsay and uh, lucky star that's over 100 miles i guess uh, apart um now uh, the Renee deal was different. It was, she was staying in an RV and doing a, uh, podcast with fans on the, uh, computer, a little laptop. She said when something slapped against the front of this RV that, um, uh, she was staying in and it, they, she said, you can see in the video, me jerk to look at towards where the slap happened. And then you can watch me as it was like it sounded like a hand dragging down the length of the RV. Uh, I think it was about a 30 foot RV. And she said, you can watch me watch it all the way to the very back of the RV. And then it's like it leaned over and pushed itself off of the RV. And she said, you see my hand bobble and shake. And uh, she said, it's, a couple seconds, she jumped up, grabbed her light, went out, and there was nothing to be seen. Also, between the trailer, outside the trailer door, there was bare, not a blade of grass, wet, uh, freshly rained on uh, clay, and seven foot away, freshly poured uh, gravel uh, was started. And she measured this with a tape measure. So from the trailer to the gravel was seven foot. There was not a print in that seven foot. So someone was pulling a someone was pulling a joke on her somehow and reaching over from the gravel with a mop head or whatever. I don't know. Uh, Or it was a Bigfoot. Now, I'm going to tell you that this family down in Lindsay said that they had Bigfoots out there all the time of all colors and all sizes. Like they were gray, they were brown, they were blonde, they were black. There were bigger ones, there were smaller ones. That's what their story is. So that's where she was when this happened. That wasn't in the show. I mean, uh, including me, it was better than, <laughs> better than anything that would have been in that episode. Uh, but it was left out. And I. it's always bothered me. Uh, it's always bothered me about the hair samples. It's always bothered me about the story about Renee that I just told. Um, and she told it to me in a whispering voice like it was a secret. Huh. Now, I know that I have heard stories uh, firsthand from people over the years 
where things have been left out of the show that they didn't really understand why, but nothing as significant as what you said. And I know that, uh, I've heard, I don't know Renee personally, but I have heard in the past that her role in the show was as the scientifically minded skeptic, but she's not as skeptical as she appears on the show. I've heard that as well. Um, but it's all just, you know, stories that people say. So yeah, everybody that meets me want to know one thing is Renee as hot as she is on the show. In person. <laughs> I've heard she is. I've been, I have been asked that like six, seven times out of the blue. And I'm like, what? I, I have heard from people that know her personally and have met her in person that, uh, she is a very attractive woman. In person, she was she was the sweetest uh, gal that she could be. All, all of them was very nice. Like I told you, I had a little rubber boat. I'm not saying Oklahoma's stunk, but other than that, yeah, uh, Oklahoma don't smell like no cow's nice ass. Just for the record, <laughs> right? Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Oh, and when no. we took one, a uh, funny one for the listeners or whatever is the whole time we were floating. I because uh, well <laughs> because just because let's say I gave Matt my slipperiest let's say kayak and i was waiting the entire time for him to tip over <laughs> and right at the very end of our trip he fell in oh wow and uh, <laughs> oh my god Every, everybody just got the biggest kick out of it <laughs> yeah, he fell in north Canada, right at the end of it. you know the the thing that really stands out to me about what you're saying is the hair samples Mm -hmm. especially since you mentioned, you know, the lucky star. Mm -hmm. Now, see, this deal's got, got every hair sample in the world, you know, supposedly in it. If you give them a hair, it's going to spit out and tell you what it's at, what it is, or it's supposed to. Evans, I imagine you know the story behind the lucky star, don't you? Yes, sir. Yeah, very familiar with that one. Uh, let me ask, is it the 11 and a half foot Bigfoot that, that, that ducks under a light behind it and gets in a dumpster? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think they're saying the minimum was it had to be at least 10 feet tall. Yeah. Okay. Um, it's been on TV shows, talked about a casino in Oklahoma where the rumor was uh, there was security footage, clear security footage of a Bigfoot raiding the uh, grease trap dumpster behind the casino, I believe. And you could see the Bigfoot duck its head under a security light out back. And the light was uh, 10 foot tall or 10 and a half foot tall or something like that. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. But the casino is pretty famous. Whenever you mention Oklahoma and Bigfoot, most people know about the casino. But, right. I, you know, mm -hmm. I don't even I don't even know now. Uh, here's just what I heard. And I have no idea. Was that Matt Moneymaker? bought the rights to that video and had it wiped from the internet and all of this and try to Google it, try to pull it up. Even, even, even the recreation of it happening, try to Google that and pull it up. I've heard lots of different stories about where the video went and why it's no longer in circulation anywhere. And, uh, I also know that, uh, a similar story has been said about, uh, a certain location in Kentucky that was investigated by Moneymaker and his group at the time where he uh, possessed all the rights to all that evidence and it disappeared from the internet. <laughs> wow. I won't speculate as to why. <laughs> I don't know why, but... Uh, well, there's there's still a lot of activity around the casino uh, each year at the Honubi conference. Uh, there are uh, people that work at the casino that will come and tell their stories, even you know things happening up to the present time of uh, of these things, uh, you know, visiting the casino. So uh, yeah, we've had it, there's one security guard that that uh, comes uh, each year and. Uh, talks about the different encounters uh there's some other staff that uh, 
uh, you know, will come and tell what what's going on currently. And so it's it's still ongoing activity. Are you getting uh, a fairly constant stream of new reports coming in? Just in general, I mean. Yes, fairly steady. Yeah, from all up and down the river. Yeah. In fact, we've even uh, had some. Uh, one of our team members lives over on the, the eastern side of the county, um, because the, you know the the river flows through Oklahoma City and then on over to Lake Eufaula, um, as Jim was saying. But uh, he just kind of stumbled on some really good uh, footprints. Uh, up a creek that runs into the river over near the uh, Choctaw area, uh, Choctaw Hara in that area. Um, and what's interesting, he said he, he found uh, some or some kids had been evidently seining back in there and they had actually looked like they had left in a hurry. They left a brand new seine net just laying there and there's these big, huge footprints all around the seine net. So, uh, you know, you just wonder, were these kids seining the creek, catching fish? Bigfoot noticed it, came out there, they ran off, left their brand new net. So who goes off and leaves a brand new seine net just laying there? Especially a couple kids, because uh, that that would be treasure. You know, that, that's yeah. a prized possession right there for a They went home, told kids. their parents, and they left it off. Yeah, uh, so, I mean, we're, we're wanting to kind of expand our and where it runs east side of the county. And then we're hearing reports from the Lexington Wildlife Management Area down between Norman and uh, Noble. Uh, uh, in fact, a correctional officer uh, was driving home and saw one cross the road down there in Lexington uh, back during this past winter. So, uh, yeah, we're getting story you know, reports all the time. Did you guys have any luck on this past trip to Stinchcomb? Well, um, we did toward the end, but uh, our kayak trip got interrupted by a, a thunderstorm. Uh, we got about to our halfway point up the river and started thundering and lightning. We had to turn around, and scoot back to the launch area. But after the storms passed, then a group of us went over back to the east side and started walking the. Uh, there's a perimeter fire road, just a dirt road that goes completely around the entire refuge on both sides of the river. And uh, so we just thought, uh, since some of our team had never even been to Stinchcombe before, um, you know, we, we would just walk that uh, perimeter fire road at night. And uh, and we got some real interesting activity there. Uh, uh, we had been walking up, uh, oh gosh, a few hundred yards and kind of talking amongst ourselves. And I was trying to describe the area to them. And just all of a sudden, just in the woods. Well, we kind of felt like something was shadowing us. So we'd kind of been seeing something on FLIR and we've been hearing some noises. Uh, but just when we stopped in this one spot and started kind of talking, uh, then right, right in the woods beside us, a whack, whack, two huge tree knocks. And that's when, uh, we got the FLIR out and we could see, uh, something moving between the trees back there and got a couple of good captures that, uh, that I sent, I sent you, Matt, um, but uh you know we looking at if it was people you would think if it was homeless back there that that uh then you would think they would try to keep quiet because they wouldn't want to be discovered they wouldn't want to be kicked out uh, uh, so you know we were discussing it amongst ourselves was that a person or is it and then at one point we saw we saw the top of another head so is it two people you know or but you look at it on FLIR and it's the image is all one solid white color. Uh, and anybody that's used FLIR knows that if you're looking at a person, then the, the uh, color comes out differently. You can see the outline of clothes, right. you know, and things like that. So we felt like we got pretty good captures there. Uh, and, and then everybody started to get that real weird funky feeling that maybe that was a warning that we had gone so far and they didn't want us going any further, but we had some folks get some, some weird vibes there. So we decided maybe it was time for us to leave. So we left about midnight. I have looked at the uh, clips that you sent me and they are definitely interesting. I hadn't had a chance to respond back to you about it. Um, but I was kind of left you know it's hard to tell whenever between being there in person and looking at the monitor 
And then when you're seeing the clips as far as distance and size is concerned, Mm -hmm. whatever it is appeared to be human size and upright on two legs for sure. And, uh, I mean, that starts narrowing down everything. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. So it's either a person or it's a, a, one of these creatures. And if it's, it's a person, they're, they're back there, they're, they're walking through the, the woods there with no light. Um, they're going to be just overwhelmed with mosquitoes, ticks, you know, all kinds of stuff. So it's very, very risky for a person to be out there at night, especially wandering around with no light. You know, it just seems like uh, the evidence mounts up more toward it being, you know, a couple of these creatures. And a lot of the tracks we found out there, a lot of the footprints we found uh, have not been huge. They've been in that, uh, you know, around that 12 inch, anywhere from 10 to 12 inch range. So, you know, is it juveniles? Are they the most active? Are they the most curious, you know, and and following us up and down through there? Uh, It's just, you know, speculation. Right. Uh, Is this stuff posted anywhere on the Internet for people to look at? Uh, Yes. Uh, We're we're also affiliated with the uh, Native Oklahoma Bigfoot Research Organization, or we call it NOBRO for short. Um, And NOBRO has a a website. It's nobrobigfoot.org. And there is an evidence page on that website. And it has the uh, photos, casts, uh, video, FLIR, audio of what you know what we have found uh not only in the stinchcomb area but uh, but all over the state um uh, but a lot of our stinchcomb material is on there and of course then our north canadian river project uh page on facebook um there's uh one of our team members ryan white uh very gifted with the video and uh has produced uh videos of of our uh trips camp outs uh day trips um to these areas and uh, he has footage of, of, of all these, these things that we've, uh, collected. And that's on the Squatch Rangers YouTube channel. Yeah. You can go to Squatch Ranger on YouTube. Um, uh, it's also posted on our NCRP page. Uh, and then a uh, Squatch Ranger also has a website, uh, and a YouTube channel. Yeah. Anybody out there who has had an encounter or experienced something, and they would like to talk to someone who won't think they're crazy or judge them uh, and might be able to offer a little help, you can, of course, contact Evans or the North Canadian River Project and find somebody that's there to listen and maybe check out your area and help you figure out what's going on. Right. That's why we're affiliated with uh, NOBRO. We're affiliated with the Honabi Conference. One of our goals was to establish a statewide network. We could share research amongst each other and uh, and uh, you know pass along sighting reports and investigate sighting reports and and uh, just help each other out. All right. Well, guys, I think that will about cover it for this episode. I appreciate you coming on, Jim. I appreciate you coming on and sharing your Enjoy. stories and experiences. Uh, definitely interesting stuff. I always enjoy hearing uh, new accounts of Bigfoot encounters, especially in the fine state of Oklahoma. Uh, Evans, it's been a pleasure as usual. Is there any uh, final thoughts or anything you guys would like to share? I, I was thinking of one, and it was when I actually had my one eyesight encounter i was absolutely stealth silent but the two times the rocks got thrown at me we were kind of yucking it up and laughing and talking and carrying on so you know for investigators or hunters or whatever uh, there's probably no absolute (laughs) way uh of going about that but i'm i'm saying talking attracts them and if you if if you don't think one of them can be snuck up on or that they're an interdimensional creature or anything like that i don't think an interdimensional creature would let you sneak up on it and we startled the one that we saw so i just want to say that what do you think would have happened if you if your uh, wife at the time hadn't 
seen it. Do you think he would have just crouched there and let you guys go on by? Probably. Because we had no reaction. I was looking the opposite direction. I didn't even take note of the bush on the side of the bank. And maybe it would have just let. But the way she described it jerking its head and like its eyes about to pop out of its head like, oh, my God, what the hell? How did I let a human sneak up on me? (laughs) I'm not supposed to do this. That was kind of the reaction that she conveyed to me and yeah it probably would have let us just go run on by you know i mean it it could have touched my wife i never felt so hopeless and helpless and scared and everything at once in my life if you'd like to talk about your own bigfoot encounter or if you're looking for help from a bigfoot investigator in your area email me at bigfootcrossroads at gmail.com also be sure to check out the facebook page and give it a like at facebook.com forward slash Bigfoot Crossroads. Be sure to check out my other podcast, Planet Fear, where myself and Lauren Smith talk about all the fearful and frightening things out there, from encounters with the paranormal to stories of true crime. Go to planetfearpodcast.com for new episodes and links to all the places you can find us.